uh, organization and also she is a member of board of trustees of National Children's Hospital of Madrid. Let me start from giving the floor to uh, Katerina uh, Maternova, uh, Deputy Director General for Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement. And um, uh, Katerina uh, is a good uh, friend and real supporter of transformation of Ukraine. So Katerina, uh, recently Joseph Borrell mentioned that EU approves disbursement of uh, 500 million of, uh, millions of euros in macro financial assistance to Ukraine. Uh, the EU ambassador here in Kyiv uh, made a statement that work has also already started on the next EU macro financial assistance to Ukraine, worth 1.2 billion euro, more COVID related and so disbursed more quickly than the previous one, but some conditionality will still be there. So Ukraine, we Ukrainians highly appreciate EU technical and financial support for Ukraine. It really helps us to become stronger and to move forward towards deeper integration with the European Union and our integration to the EU and NATO is incorporated in our constitution. So uh, could you please tell us about the priorities for the EU support in COVID-19 response uh, providing to Ukraine and healthcare reform. Uh, because our today's topic is transparent and accountable healthcare system in Ukraine. So uh, could you focus on the priorities and your, uh, as a representative of the EU Commission, expectations from Ukrainian government uh, about the efficiency of money to be spent and cooperation and progress in uh, important reforms like healthcare reform, decentralization, education, pension, which started uh, several years ago, but it's now important to continue this reform. So, uh, Katerina, the floor is yours. Please, uh, you're welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Hannah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear uh, co-panel members definitely in the majority women i love to be we need to come up with a word uh, the opposite of manals which is i don't know vanals uh, it's great to be with such uh, powerful and smart ladies uh, on the panel and and the uh, the notable gentlemen um two uh, words come to mind but uh, when i when i am going to give my quick remarks and that's solidarity and uh, resilience and i'll explain why uh, but before that let me just uh, sort of finish my introduction that currently i'm uh, i'm one of the victims of covid not in terms of health but uh, the uh, former head of the support group for ukraine was actually taken to work on uh, medical equipment distribution in the eu so i actually have two jobs right now uh, the one you mentioned, Deputy Director General, but also uh, I'm the acting head for the, of the support group for Ukraine. So I'm even closer dealing with Ukraine than, than before. So it's, it's, it's double the pleasure to, to be here. So uh, let me just say why I, why I mentioned these two words. Uh, first of all, resilience is the theme that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, put together for the overall narrative of the next generation of Eastern Partnership programs. We had a communication adopted in the first ever virtual meeting of the College of Commissioners in March that has as a meta theme resilience and that was uh, drafted and, and, and approved way before the COVID uh, hit us. And I think it showed, especially in the COVID crisis, how important the concept of resilience is. And this is where I need to really congratulate Ukraine and Ukrainian society, Ukrainian um, civil society, Ukrainian authorities, and everyone in handling the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, actions were taken early. You managed to uh, flatten the curve much better than, than uh, in, in many other countries. The testing capacity uh, right now is really um, impressive. Uh, you have uh, engaged with the WHO very early on. Uh, we are happy to support that effort. And uh, yes, of course, we are not out of the woods. There is a very high percentage of health workers that are infected. So it's 
it's it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, an easy and an easy uh, uh, situation. But but I think the resolute action at the beginning was uh, was important. Now that's as far as uh, uh, the resilience uh, goes, and I'll get to the health uh, health reform in a, in a second. The second word I mentioned is uh, solidarity, and I'm glad that it's perceived that way in Ukraine because uh, I really have never seen um, such fast sort of reaction and reprogramming and reorientation of our assistance as we as we did at the beginning of the COVID crisis. By the 8th of April, uh, we actually put together this this Team Europe uh, uh, communication by uh, through which we were able to to really uh, reorient and make relevant to the crisis the assistance that uh, that we have. I mean, we are at the end of our funding cycle, so we didn't have new money, but we were able to really postpone things that can be postponed and 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 reprioritize uh, other. Uh, you know, COVID relevant uh, measures. And this is the, uh, this is the package that we were able to put together in two, in two installments uh, for Ukraine in the amount of 192 million euros of bilateral assistance, which includes both assistance to the immediate medical needs by financing mostly WHO um, uh, work in Ukraine on, uh, on, uh, on purchasing procurement of uh, testing material and the, P and the personal protective equipment, uh, etc. Uh, another big part of it goes to support the liquidity of especially medium, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, that are going to be very much uh, 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 the victims of the of the economic crisis that is the flip side of acting early on the medical side means that you the, the economic pain is uh, is obviously very big but apart from money we also uh, were able to get agreement to have ukraine become an observer member along with our western balkans uh, 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 partner countries in the health security committee that was set up by member states to really react uh, quickly in the in the crisis and in addition to that uh, we as you mentioned uh, we were able to disburse after the the agreement with the IMF the previous uh, microfinancial assistance the second tranche of 500 million and we are in negotiations on the Second one has been approved by by it's been approved to actually allocate 1.2 billion to Ukraine, but now we are in the middle of discussions of the so-called memorandum of understanding, which is going to detail the conditions for the second tranche. The first tranche is a, 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 an emergency COVID uh, tranche that is released immediately upon upon agreement and approval of the memorandum of understanding without conditions. So I think this sort of captures the, the sense of really solidarity that all of us uh, feel with, uh, with Ukraine and other countries uh, when it comes to, to, to COVID. Now, my third point, and I only have four points, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I, I know I'm probably running over time, but try to be quick. Um, the third point I want to make is that COVID hit in the middle of, uh, of the health reforms or with health reforms in Ukraine underway. And, and what I want to say is that, you know, reforms like these really structural, deep structural reforms is something that sometimes take generations to implement. It's, it, it certainly is beyond the, the office of one government or, or, or one president. These are, and these are, many of them are big, difficult, complicated reforms. I come from Slovakia, so perhaps I have a little bit more patience than some of my colleagues from countries that didn't go through this deep post-communist transformation uh, in terms of what it takes and, and how complex these uh, reforms are. And often it's, you know, two step forward, one step back or one step sideways. And, and I think that uh, the EU and Ukraine have, didn't, have been at this um, in the, for the long haul. 
uh, which doesn't mean that we only have patience, we also have expectations and we also have ambitions for a modern and corruption-free and well-governed uh, and prosperous Ukraine. And that's my, my fourth point, uh, just to say that uh, we were very happy with the, and, and, and with you, and as you know, supporting the, the health reform as such. I think that by all accounts, the first phase um, of the primary care reform has been a success. Um, and we do hope that we are able to uh, withstand the pressures of COVID and withstand all sorts of other pressures and carry out the reform as planned. Obviously, there may need to be some technical adjustments. Also with the crisis, maybe the optic on, on, on what needs to happen uh, may get adjusted here and there. But I think that the main principles, which is the uh, patient-centered uh, approach and the performance-based approach and corruption-free uh, uh, healthcare is something that needs to set, stay with us. And uh, so it's a little bit disconcerting to see the, and this is not only in the case of, of, of the health ministry, is a little bit disconcerting the, 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 the rather expansive interpretation that is given to the idea of nominations uh, through emergency measures because we are in an emergency. I mean, sure, that needs to happen and institutions need to function, but, but some of these need to be, need to be uh, revisited in some areas. And we very much hope that the head of the NHS will be selected through an open and transparent process. And by the same token, um, when it comes to the procurement of medical equipment, uh, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, the, the, the money, we, the, the money we, we, we give you is, is given for, for uh, the idea of supporting the health uh, of the Ukrainian citizens and that uh, it should be procured, any, any equipment uh, needs to be procured in the most efficient uh, way possible. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, in fact, medical procurement is one of the uh, conditions that is being discussed for the, for the macrofinancial uh, assistance. So this is something, this is an area that we are looking at very closely as well. And I will stop here. Thank you, Katerina. And of course, we understand your double responsibility, also <laughs> acting head of the Ukraine support group and true believer and optimist uh, towards Ukraine's future. Uh, thank you also for um, pushing us hard. And now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, ready to give the floor to Oksana Mochan, acting head of National Health Service of Ukraine. I know Oksana from National Reform Council um, when she was an expert and was designing the healthcare reform and now she's an acting head of National Health Service. There are lots of information discrediting, unfortunately, Ukraine uh, about uh, competition uh, which uh, Ms. Minister Stepanov uh, now is conducting and interviews in the closed doors for the future um, head of the National Health Service. And uh, Oksana, could you please briefly update us on the situation in uh, National uh, Health uh, Service of Ukraine, uh, their competition for new head, uh, how you work for, on COVID-19 response, maybe some political pressure or challenges, because uh, as um, Katerina Maternova mentioned, it's really important to make healthcare reform irreversible and second stage and then third stage according to the democratic principles with uh, transparency. So please. Uh, Hannah, thank you. So I'm so happy to see you again. Thank you for this opportunity. I just want to make a brief introduction together with me today is uh, Alona Garoshka. She's actually the uh, key uh, financial engineer behind the program of medical guarantee. And I will like from time to time will be passing the word to her and she might she might be able to explain you in more detail what is the financial um, arguments behind the 
the design of the program of, of the first program of medical guarantees in Ukraine and the whole uh, idea of universal health coverage for Ukraine. So uh, very briefly, I will um, just to remind you that uh, NHS was established in 2018. Uh, the first stage of the reform uh, started in, in, in this year, in this 2019, was the new financing mechanism for primary health care facilities. The NHS succeeded to contract almost all uh, primary health care facilities in this first year, including a number of uh, private, uh, private ones. We have uh, almost 1,000 um, primary health care providers, uh, around 200 uh, private health care providers, and uh, over 300 individuals. In uh, 2019, the next year after establishment, NHS has taken over the next um, uh, drugs reimbursement program, uh, which is focused on chronic diseases. Uh, by introduction of e-prescription in half a year, the NHS has achieved transparent and effective management uh, of the program, improved access to medicines, and high enrollment of patients into the program. And this year, on April 1st, uh, the second stage of the healthcare, healthcare reform um, at all healthcare levels uh, was successfully implemented. The NHS has contracted 100% uh, of public specialized and emergency um, uh, care uh, facilities. Uh, it's uh, around 1,600 specialized facilities, uh, 64 are private ones, and uh, 24 emergency centers, uh, emergency care centers. Uh, these facilities total, um, these facilities represent outpatient and uh, inpatient hospital care, emergency care, rehabilitation, and palliative care. Uh, in total, 26 different types of contracts have been signed. The contracts reflect various priorities defined uh, by Ministry of Health of Ukraine and related out by, um, uh, output based payments. They also introduce uh, the principle money follows uh, the patient, which is pretty much different from the old Soviet system. As of now, health services are being directly paid to the healthcare providers by NHS uh, based on their performance. Um, uh, around um, 10 billion grievances have already been paid to the providers in the, frame, in the framework of program of medical guarantees. Within the principle, money follows the patient, efficient and quality hospitals are now in, receive more money than they used to under the medical subvention, and they are incentivized to improve their uh, services further. We do support uh, the government aspiration to increase financing on the health healthcare uh, system, but we as NHS also understand the major fiscal constraints and expected decline in economy this year, um, coupled with growing uh, healthcare uh, needs of the population. Uh, and in these uh, circumstances, we do not support uh, the reallocation of scarce public resources among all existing healthcare facilities uh, in Ukraine, as uh, according to their historical budgets, as it was proposed by the minister. Instead, we believe that the health system needs priorities based on patients' needs, not infrastructure maintenance. The health financing reform was designed based on the principles of efficiency of, of allocation of resources to deliver effective and high quality care. The proposed U-turn would endanger essential uh, service delivery. Um, just a few words on, um, uh, on uh, COVID response. To increase the protection of Ukrainians during the COVID-19 epidemic, the government of Ukraine allocated additional 15.7 billion grievances. The four additional um, uh, medical packages were added to the program of medical guarantees. They are inpatient treatment package, emergency package, mobile crew, uh, cruise package, uh, and temporary contracts for those facilities who were, uh, who were not identified as um, COVID dedicated network, but they were providing uh, services to the patients in April. Um, and uh, in particular, with, with, as to the emergency centers, NHS was able during the four uh, uh, non-working days, there were public holidays in Ukraine to contract uh, all 25 emergency care uh, providers. And uh, within the next uh, day, we were able to uh, proceed the payments to the, to the providers. Uh, a few words um, as to the competition of the new hat. Um, the, based on the current reg legislation, the prime minister has two options. Mm -hmm. He has the option to run uh, like a fully fully fledged um, uh, um, competition, um, uh, and also he has an opportunity to um, 
that there is a procedure of hiring public servants during the period of quarantine uh, under the new law um, of Ukraine 553, uh, like to run um, a short procedure. Or, or, uh, it's not a competition, it's uh, more of an interview. From the legal perspective, these are two different processes. Moreover, the procedure of hiring public servants during the quarantine period has nothing to do with transparent and honest one. The minister alone is authorized to choose uh, any candidate he or she likes uh, without any previously approved criteria or kind of reasoning whatsoever. And it is very uh, handy approach to get like your person um, at the senior positions. Uh, in contrast to this approach, the regular process uh, of competition for public service uh, foresees a fully transparent procedure of multi-stage uh, um, comprehensive competition. Such a procedure ensures the worthy and highly professional candidates uh, are allowed to take the final interviews and um, if succeeded to take the position. These were actually the two, um, uh, uh, the two kinds of uh, competition that I uh, ran uh, as a, first as a deputy head of NHS and then uh, competing for the NHS head in um, January this year. Uh, furthermore, the COVID-19 lockdown and quarantine restrictions are loosened now in Ukraine and uh, people are back to work, public transport restrictions uh, are uh, lifted. And in this regard, this is no ground to, to, to not to have a full-scale uh, competition. Alona, would you like to add anything with regards to uh, either uh, COVID, um, COVID response or maybe like a comment on, uh, uh, on ideas that we've discussed with the, uh, uh, with the current uh, Minister of Health with regards how the program of medical guarantees could be changed? Yeah, um, I have a few comments with regard to what Katarina said about patient-centered uh, approach for healthcare. I think that um, now what we're doing with the benefit package currently in Ukraine just reflects on this patient-centeredness. For instance, for uh, COVID-19, there were a lot of uh, discussions if patients should be hospitalized to the closest uh, facility, which has a very poor equipment, or he or she should be transported to the fully equipped and staffed facility. So in our work and in the program of medical guarantees, we just follow the principle that if uh, the facility is paid for service, then they must have um, all equipment and all staff needed to provide care for those people. So we now have around 300 providers who are uh, checked for having uh, equipment and staff to provide services for COVID patients. We also supported this approach for other types of services. So this is uh, the first uh, steps towards making the system working for patients. can't hear you. Um, uh, thank you, Oksana and your colleague, uh, for um, updating us on current uh, status. And uh, before I give a floor to um, uh, um, Arsene uh, Jumadilov, um, I think that it's uh, important now to uh, give an opportunity to Olya Stefanishina, member of Ukrainian parliament, for quick reaction, especially uh, regarding the competition on the head of the NHS. I think it's really important to use parliamentary oversight and uh, to use all mechanisms to guarantee that the competition will be really transparent, no corruption, and the new head of NHS will be truly dedicated to the reform and uh, because it's a huge responsibility for around four billions of uh, do US dollars. It's a um, taxpayer's money. And it's also about trust, trust of Ukrainian uh, civil society. And uh, we know that a number of NGOs, they asked Minister Stepanov to broadcast interviews uh, live, but he refused. Um, there are different information why he refused, because he already has pre-approved candidates, but still. So um, I know Ola Stefanishina for many years, uh, she used to represent the patient's organization. Then she was one who introduced within the Ministry of Health uh, uh, procurement of medical treatments through international organizations, well-known anti-corruption uh, activists now serving the nation as a member of parliament. So please, uh, Ola, could you um, tell us about the healthcare reform in Ukraine? 
and what could be done to prevent uh, such um, unpleasant situation with the competition for the future head of NHS. Please. Uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, for this discussion, uh, happy to see uh, all of you and uh, of course I would like to um, thank uh, deeply to our partners uh, from European Union for, for the support and uh, um, the fact that you continue supporting Ukraine uh, is very important for us, for those who are fighting for uh, democratic principles uh, and um, anti-corruption in Ukraine. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would really like to react uh, on the issue of NHSU uh, director appointment because this is one of the most uh, urgent issue now and um, uh, previous speakers talked about the importance of healthcare reform and the success of primary um, care reform and uh, I totally support uh, the idea that uh, the reform should continue and the principle of patient-centered approach and uh, paying for service uh, should be um, continued and uh, uh, we have no other options but um, at the moment uh, you should understand that we really have a very difficult situation in healthcare and um, it uh, mostly concerns the fact that uh, for nine months already the Minister of Health uh, is in a process of constant turbulence due to the fact that uh, the ministers of health uh, are, ch are being changed constantly. Uh, improper people are appointed on their positions and uh, this leads to the fact that uh, people who come uh, don't understand the issue, don't understand the reform and uh, they actually block a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things. Uh, first, uh, concerns procurements of uh, drugs and medical, uh, medical devices. I think uh, Olya Kudilenko from Tabletochki will also tell more about this issue. Uh, but uh, also we uh, really see the attempts to roll back the healthcare reform, both from the side of uh, Minister of Health, uh, Prime Minister of Ukraine and, and the President. Uh, we consider that the President is badly informed about the uh, main principle of the reform and its importance. Uh, Minister of Health of Ukraine, Mr. Stepano, seems to manipulate the facts and uh, give uh, false information uh, to the President and Prime Minister of Ukraine. We have facts when uh, the documents were even uh, given to the Cabinet of Ministers uh, in, in a changed uh, mode, which uh, Actually, the, uh, um, uh, it's a collision of, of uh, the legislation. So, um, coming back to NHSU, um, we, uh, as Oksana described, we had uh, uh, approved the legislation which gives some simplified procedures to the Ministry of Health to conduct uh, the selection of, uh, um, uh, of heads of uh, different institutions. Uh, but uh, this... Uh, uh, possibility was given only to uh, simplify the procedure in the uh, urgent need. But uh, Minister of Health decided to appoint the head of NHSU without any competition, any procedures and any mechanisms. In fact, uh, Mr. Stepano is trying to do it uh, um, personally without um, any, uh, any um, transparent uh, processes. Uh, indeed, uh, a lot of uh, NGOs, uh, international organizations and journalists uh, wanted to see how the uh, interviews with uh, the candidates for this position have been taking place but uh, they were actually closed from, from the society. Uh, using my uh, uh, deputy uh, possibilities, I um, 
visited the Ministry of Health yesterday and was trying to broadcast these interviews uh, to show people how uh, it happens. Uh, but the minister didn't let me do it, doing it. Despite of the fact that uh, I'm allowed and there is no uh, collision in the legislation, uh, I'm allowed to broadcast those interviews. He didn't agree. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, a part of interviews didn't take place, which gave us some time uh, to to follow up with this situation. Uh, today, uh, he didn't manage to uh, bring uh, the candidate to to the interview uh, to, to the cabinet of ministers' approval, which means that we have a couple of days to react on this uh, well uh, unprecedented, I would say, uh, case. Uh, the interviews are uh, very uh, formal and uh, uh, they last around uh, 15 minutes uh, and it, it's really visible that the minister uh, doesn't take any effort to even to pretend that uh, this is uh, some kind of uh, competition. So uh, we presume that uh, there is a person who will, would like to take this position uh, and is already pre-selected, but the Minister of Health uh, should uh, pretend that uh, he's selecting this person by interviewing other candidates. In fact, uh, we uh, uh, consider that uh, there is already uh, some decision made, uh, which is not uh, actually uh, good for all of us, as uh, we see that uh, there is no goodwill from the minister to, to continue this reform. And um, he is just looking for convenient person uh, to uh, roll it back. Uh, I'm very much concerned about the situation and consider that uh, in case we let uh, minister do so, uh, we actually will lose NHSU as a body which should implement the reform. I truly believe that those people who work there at the moment uh, are highly, uh, highly high professionals who know the reform in every detail and we should not lose these people but appointing a, a person who would roll uh, out the reform we will we will see that uh, the reform the form will be stopped so um, today uh, I talk about it uh, at our committee. We will also raise this issue in front of Prime Minister of Ukraine, but uh, we uh, really think that uh, international organization support uh, is very important in, in this. And uh, in case there is any opportunity and possibility to talk uh, to uh, the president, president of Ukraine, to the Prime Minister of Ukraine and explain the importance of independent and uh, transparent processes of appointing such important position in the country uh, where uh, uh, the majority of healthcare budget is operated is very important. So um, I would really appreciate if uh, our international uh, society and community could help us, that will be very helpful. And I also want to thank all people who work at NHSU and who are fighting for healthcare reform. They do a lot of things to stop uh, all this um, uh, crap, sorry, which is uh, happening at, at the healthcare system. And they are my heroes. So thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, Olga. Thank you so much for your support. It, we so much need to hear this. Thank you. All of us, I will pass it to Alona. We will pass it to the team. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Olga, for your strong position. And I think it was really very, not brave, but principal um, uh, position to came to yesterday to the minister office using your parliamentary oversight obligations and opportunities and to guarantee that the competition has to be transparent. And I think it's really important to pass this message to the president because one year ago he promised uh, that no corruption, no trends working, no um, bad guys. And it's really, it's about not just his reputation, it's about trust to Ukraine from our Western partners, which are supporting Ukraine countering Russian aggression, hybrid warfare, and also supporting our reforms. So I think it's a nice time to give a floor to Viola von Kramon, a member of European Parliament, 
and uh, Viola belongs to those MPs at the European Parliament uh, who knows the geopolitical importance of Ukraine and transformation, such a huge country as Ukraine is. So, and uh, Viola is monitoring the situation with all reforms, decentralization and preparation for local elections, education reform, and healthcare is also among her priority. And the message from Olga Stefanishina that our Western partners now has to be uh, very loudly uh, mentioning about accountability and transparency. So please, uh, Viola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thanks to Antak and especially thanks to uh, the staff of the NHSU and also to Olga. I watched your visit yesterday in the ministry. I was heavily impressed by your courage and by your creative way of uh, trying to oversight what the minister finally did there. So I think that fits well in the picture what many of you have uh, uh, drawn today and uh, what kind of information is, is uh, in, the, in the loop. Um, I guess I would like to start a little bit before because Katarina Matanova mentioned uh, the situation in Ukraine in general, which is true, and reforms in general take a long time. But I would also like to remind everybody, we have already 30 times after the independence, almost 30 times after the independence, and people become impatient. And it's right that become, they become impatient because the Ukrainians have deserved a better governance and a better health service system. And that's why we were all of, all of us uh, in the international community lobbying for a service oriented quality oriented health reform and then we were all so happy that after all this pressure because the system fought back already when Ulyana Suprun was a minister there was big resistance against everything and it was up to you to Olga Kodinenko and others from patient organization, from NGOs, from professionals, from the international community to push this uh, new concept, this new idea, this new reform through. And of course, we have to make sure that this is irreversible, um, irreversible. but when you see that what was mentioned by many of you, obviously the president in the country does not understand why he has to continue with this reform. He is obviously influenced by those who formerly had uh, uh, resisted these reforms, who were fighting on the, let's say, old Soviet system of health uh, um, uh, reform or health, not health reform, but uh, health system. And that's make it currently very, very difficult uh, to overcome uh, this, uh, this blockade within the ministry, but also I see within the government. And of course, I was very outspoken on the weekend and we were drafting a statement, Ukrainian and English, where we are saying it's, I mean, the problem is in energy, you have some oligarchs fighting for their interests. They have vested interests. Yeah? So, and in each of the sectors, even in education, you have um, uh, parents in there, you have people fighting for their interests. But now, since we are at the very beginning of these reforms, and we have patients on one side, which is, let's say, a very abstract group of people, they are not well organized in a way. They do not have a strong voice in the country. They do not have a strong lobby organization. They do not have an oligarch behind them fighting for their interest. They do not have a money put into there. So it is up to us, the international community, somehow to defend this reform, to, to save this, to make sure that the interest of ordinary people, as I said, who have deserved a better way of healthcare system, that we together manage the second phase or the second uh, step of the reform in a way which is, as Katarina and others have mentioned, transparent and which is conducted with Oxana and others in the uh, health uh, uh, state uh, uh, agency by competent and independent people, independent people, because there's a lot of money in there. And of course, if you know, you have 3% of your GDP, 86 billion 
uh, Ukrainian Grivna is a lot of money. And there's a big temptation, not just by the minister, but a lot of friends of different ministers, how to, let's say, participate from this big uh, part of the cake. And so we have to make sure when we give money from the European level that you buy uh, equipment, you buy medical equipment. This money is not thrown out of the window. This money doesn't disappear in some of the dark channels. That money doesn't disappear in what the president was lobbying for a year ago before he became president in an anti-corrupted, transparent, civilized manner. Yeah? And now we see exactly the opposite. And that's why I'm so harsh on this. And that's why I'm so outspoken. And I think that's my right and that's my obligation to do so. Because otherwise, yeah, you see, there is, uh, I mean, if you follow uh, this or you trace uh, the, the structures of who actually would have gained from this fake procurement what the minister had in mind, there is a company somehow linked to Avakov and his interior ministry. And then there's another person and people coming in. So you see, it is not uh, the anti-corruption, let's say, side of the uh, government being supported by the president, but it's the opposite. And it will be up to us, the international community, to remind the president what he was up to and why he was um, uh, running this campaign for anti-corruption, anti-oligarchization, anti yeah, uh, and and now when it comes to the health uh, care reform, uh, the health system, we see exactly the opposite. We know from Mr. Stepanov uh, that his, let's say, uh, CV, uh, his biography uh, shows some of, uh, let's say, not just a clean um, uh, a backpack uh, of uh, history. So I think there is a big skepticism, which is good. Uh, and we should uh, give this skepticism, let's say, a broader voice. Uh, we should articulate what was happening during the first month of his, uh, uh, his time in office. Um, and I'm happy to support you in any way we can, because I see that people in the regions, especially people with low budget, I mean, many of you will probably already have like a, a private uh, in insurance uh, before the health reform, but many people didn't have this. And they had to pay a lot of money to get even a basic coverage in an ordinary hospital where, I mean, the, the, the quality was really poor. And now we finally improved the quality, we have lowered the cost, we had a transparent system, and we cannot step back from, from this standard. That's what I'm really fighting for, and I'm happy to take all the questions which might come up. Thank you, Viola. So we will uh, open our Q&A session just after uh, three more speeches. So now uh, it's my honor to give the floor to Ola Kudin. Ola from 2012. Ola is a co-founder of Tabletochki Charity Foundation. And Ola knows exactly what corruption means in the healthcare system. When money is stolen from state budget, are not going to the buying uh, medical treatment for children. Because Ola, besides Tabletochki, she is the a member of Board of Trustees of National Children's Hospital Ohmadit, located in Kiev, and annually um, she, together with uh, her team, is um, generating money to replace the state one to help children to survive. So corruption in healthcare system means uh, killing lives, especially children. Oh, and I'm also a uh, pleasure to see uh, Dmitro Huri, member of Ukrainian parliament, uh, she is also belonging to anti-corruption fighter in healthcare system. He is uh, one of the supporters of healthcare reform. I know Dmitro from uh, Euro on Maidan, from Dignity Revolution, and I could say that he is one of the, not designer, but um, implementator of healthcare reform. But now please, Ola, and then Dmitro, we will uh, turn the floor to you. Please, Ola. Hi everyone, I'm running Charity Foundation Tablettochki for almost nine years. We help like 
more than 4,000 kids directly for this whole time. And we spent last year more than $3 million of dollars to help kids. And what I would like to say, it's very hard to make changes and to be liked by other people. That's what's trying to do our government right now. They have a television, they have a opportunity to talk to a lot of people, but they don't listen. They're just telling about some interests of people. They're talking about doctors, so they're to talking about some hospitals which are um, not providing any services, not good, not bad, just any. Uh, in my nine years experience, I saw a lot of cases with kids who were not diagnosed at this at, at right time, uh, who were who were treated and cured in an unprofessional and very bad way. And we unfortunately lost those lives. Uh, unfortunately, kids and their parents are in such trouble. They are fighting for their lives and they cannot speak and they cannot speak from television. They don't have time for that. And when they're trying to, and when parents who lost their children trying to talk on television, on with journalists, on any uh, floors that they can have, uh, the people and government doesn't listen to them because it's very um, convenient not to hear them, not to hear the truth. It's very, it's very convenient to be liked by others, by their friends. So firstly, what I would like to say, um, our, it looks like that our president and government are trying to be liked for this whole year. They changed three minister of health and none of them are continuing the same thing that was begun by previous team. Uh, previous team kind of uh, maybe uh, not right everywhere, but they done some good things and we can continue doing this and help our patients because the reform and all the situation we have right now in medical reform in Ukraine are about patients, not about doctors, not about hospitals, not about, not, not about politics. It's about patients. We have 40 million patients and we need to think about them. That's the first point. The second point, uh, it's very hard to it's very hard to uh, see all the not transparent things again with national healthcare system. Uh, this year we had budgets for oncology for 70% more than we had last year. If it will be changed, we will lose 11.5 11, 11 million grievances per day. It's crucial for our kids and for uh, adults who have cancer. We have very bad survival rate. Nobody talks, but we have 50% survival rate for kids, which are 30% less than in Europe. We lost like 50% of all kids who had diagnosed cancer. And I think uh, the statistics for adults are even more. And that's convenient not to, to think about this. The third point about COVID situation. Um, uh, you uh, donated us, give us, provide us money to fight COVID-19 in Ukraine and help us a lot. But uh, the tests are not done, uh, are not doing for kids right now. And kids and their parents are not accepted to the hospital for their usual treatment. And they lose time. The thing with cancer, that when you lose time, you lose your chances to fight cancer and to be alive. And the last thing, but not the least, uh, three, uh, U Ukraine was, um, uh, was selected as one of the country, as one of the main countries for World Health Organization to provide the initiative for childhood cancer to improve the survival rate uh, up to 60% all over the world. And three ministers, it was very hard to push them to sign the agreement for with uh, WHO. We signed it, but nothing got done by current minister, by previous ministers, and we are losing days, um, money, uh, time uh, to implement new approach to treat, to cure and care for the kids. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure, Arsen will talk about this and Dmitry will talk, I'm pretty sure. We will, we will be lack of um, uh, pills for, with treatment in September. Uh, mi current minister hasn't started uh, to, buy, to buy pills for kids in government level. So we will be lack of pills for kids with cancer already in September. 
and it will be crucial because non-foundation, uh, any family doesn't have such uh, amount of money, such amount of resources to provide um, normal and uh, normal um, uh, not normal treatment, uh, normal treatment that can that can help kids. So uh, I I just have hope that our voices today from patients will be heard, but not by patients, but by the government who take decisions. I think that people that a lot of government people think that that they are not they are not responsible for what are happening with patients, but they are responsible. They are responsible not to start pro process at the um, right time. They are responsible not to buy pills. They are not. They are responsible how money for NHC will be used and who will be running this. And they are. They will be responsible if uh, oncological with, with if patients with oncological diseases will lose 11.5 million greens per day. So I think I, I I just have a hope they will hear and they will take action. Thank you, Ola. And now I'm uh, now presenting Metro Ugurin as a true fighter for healthcare reform. Uh, he represents the majority party. Uh, Metro, thanks for your article today. As, um, we just mentioned Ola Stefanishina. She um, was with us and her yesterday's visit to the Minister of Health, Stepanov demanding to conduct transparent competition for the head of uh, NHS. Uh, Dimitro, please uh, tell us more uh, how to pass the message to the president of Ukraine, that there are some manipulation regarding reform, and it's important that he somehow intervene and not to uh, allow this sabotage and also this fake You're gone, Hona. We couldn't hear okay. you again. Oh. oh, your turn. Okay, uh, dear colleagues, uh, hello everybody. I'm really happy to see uh, everybody here. And uh, I'm a member of the Ukrainian parliament, member of the Servant of the People fraction. Uh, and I worked in the healthcare reform team for three years. Um, and I'm also a cancer survivor. That's why the uh, situation in the healthcare system is very important uh, for me. And uh, today, the situation is in, in a huge crisis. Uh, there have been several high profile scandals over the past few weeks related to the actions of Health Minister Stepanov. Um, the first procurement was made at twice the price of uh, 70,000 protective suites which were to arrive on May, uh, May the 1st, and the half of these uh, protected suits um, uh, arrived with a delay of two weeks and the half have not yet arrived at all. And the price um, was twice higher than uh, Ukrainian market price. And two weeks ago, as uh, 7 million euros were planned to be uh, uh, spent uh, for the, also for the protected suites and the other uh, the mass respirators and so on, and this document was uh, approved by the Parliament's Budget Committee. It was planned to buy 4.4 million uh, protective suites uh, at, the, at the price uh, twice, uh, at, at the market price. And uh, it's really interesting that deputies of uh, members of Parliament, the former party from majority districts, uh, they bought for hospitals in the majority districts. Uh, this protective suites much cheaper, twice cheaper, or 1.5 uh, cheaper. Uh, and uh, we understand that we uh, buy for our hospitals like like thousands of uh, protective suites and we're talking about 4.4 4 million protective suites uh, in this uh, procurement uh, party. And uh, exceeding the price of more than a million respirators that uh, Minister Stepanov wanted to buy four times. Uh, and uh, like uh, 3 million euros so more than uh, real prices on the market only on respirators. And uh, uh, we have uh, critical situations in other, other uh, directions of um, activity of Minister of Health. Uh, the drug purchases are disrupted and in September the drug for one of uh, more than one million patients expire, including HIV patients where interruption is uh, not allow allowed at all. Uh, on the air, on the uh, press conferences, the Minister said that the oncology program where the budget has tripled in this year and uh, the birth program, um, I mean, the uh, money for patients for uh, birth is planned to, to be cancelled. Uh, 
uh, because before the election, there is not enough money for hospitals that receive less money for the money uh, full of the patient model because no one is treated there. But we will have uh, like local elections in uh, October and it's, you know, the policy is really toxic, so let's cancel the oncology program. And at the same time, today the cabinet of minister is asking for uh, 2 billion today, like two hours ago, from the COVID fund for the national guard, for the uh, police uh, department. Two, two billion. And the minister is silent. He doesn't come for the budget to the Verkhovna Rada. He doesn't ask for the budget in the cabinet of ministers. He's just silent. Yesterday and today, the minister carries out on the shortened procedure of selection for the chairman of National Health Services Ukraine, the uh, executive body which distributes 7% of state budget of Ukraine for this year. 7%. And full-fledged competition was declared unsuccessful, and now we have simplified selection. In one day, in Zoom, like we all hear in Zoom, the minister conducts interviews with all the candidates. You have to understand, in Zoom, for a day, appointed person on 7% of state budget of Ukraine. And nobody knows who, the, who, who will be this person. Whether the strategy and plan is just a man, minister uh, put his man. And we already understand for, for what for purpose he puts it on this position. I understand the confusion of international colleagues and international partner with what is happening in Ukraine uh, with minister with um, healthcare reform. But now it's the critical moment when reform ha can be halted and dismantled at all. We must prevent the allocation of 7% of, of the uh, uh, state budget through a half hour Zoom interview. And international, international partners, I ask you and beg you, you should be as direct as possible and as frank as possible with the Prime Minister of Ukraine, President of Ukraine, and the whole Cabinet of Ministers. If corrupt, corruption is planned in the uh, leaves of patients, what international support can we talk about? And now I think it's the moment when international partners, without uh, any you know, pleasant uh, words, have to say, what are you doing? It's 7% of state budget. What are you doing? And it's the main question that is, has to be uh, you know, on air now. I'm very thank, uh, thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I will be happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Dmitro. And for our audience, uh, we have uh, almost 40 participants and also on the Facebook at Gromatske um, broadcasting online. So please now you could write your question in chat. And now we have um, two more speakers and then Q&A session. So um, uh, now I would like to give a, a floor to um, Arsene Jumadilo. Uh, please, uh, Arsene, could you describe the situation uh, how um, the state enterprise of uh, procurement manages the COVID-19 uh, procurement, what results uh, you already have and what challenges you face now, please. And then Olena Sherban uh, from Anti-Corruption Action Center will uh, summarize and provide a point of view from civil society demanding transparency and accountability. Please, Arsene. Uh, dear, dear guests, dear chairwoman, I'd like to first of all thank all our international partners as well as domestic partners for their continuous support. It has been really instrumental and we've been feeling it uh, for the last couple of months increasingly because of the situation that we've faced with uh, uh, two ministers, actually first Minister Yemit, uh, who spent just one month in the office and now with the Minister Stepanov. Uh, we really, uh, we sincerely thank you for your support and we uh, really believe that uh, your support has made the difference that we still actually operate. Now I'd like to um, maybe emphasize on the philosophy why we were established and I'll explain why uh, it makes, uh, like what it, uh, what it gives us as a food for thought uh, in, the in the situation where we are at at the moment. So the CPA was created to make sure that uh, no one in, in the Ministry of Health decides on two things simultaneously. That is, first, what to buy, and second, from whom to buy. Because when you have these two functions combined, then you have a very big temptation to actually uh, abuse your power and make sure that a good guy who you know uh, wins uh, the tender. Uh, 
So with the CPA, we were created uh, back in 2018 uh, as an organization that should actually comply with the highest anti-corruption and professional standards in the industry. And uh, yet again, I'd like to thank our international donors who have been very helpful in establishing uh, the institution. The root cause for our conflict with Minister Stepanov was actually his desire to control the second function, that is, who is winning in the tender. And uh, it is something that we cannot compromise on, because if we do compromise on it, then we have a situation that somebody in the ministry be it the minister or whoever acting on his behalf, uh, they will have the uh, uh, the risk, you know, concentrated on on them with the abuse of power that I mentioned. So when we when we ran the tender, the first tender for biosecurity stewards back in April, uh, it was his question who is winning in your tender? And it was our answer that we are not giving you this information until it gets public, until it gets uh, available for everybody. There, there should be no other, um, no other you know, rules, exclusions from, uh, from, this, uh, from this principle. And then we, uh, we got stuck with the ministry for one and a half months in a situation when they really tried to somehow make sure that they manually control the procurement, be it through their tendering committee or through any other state enterprise that is under the control of the ministry. Where we are at, uh, at the moment. So if we are talking about the centralized procurement uh, of, uh, uh, of, of protective uh, equipment for COVID-19. Uh, it has been just recently, it was actually last week, then uh, when the prime minister finally uh, paid his attention to the situation, uh, saying in quite harsh words both to the minister and to me that uh, we should finally start procuring uh, the equipment centrally, because we have a very high proportion of uh, doctors who get infected because of the lack of, uh, of personal protective equipment. And it has been uh, um, during last week and this week, uh, when we actually finally, after like one and a half months break and like one and a half months uh, arguments with the minister when we actually uh, now have started uh, procuring this uh, this equipment and I can announce that for example um, today I, I very much look forward to uh, to publishing the first contract that uh, we'll be signing and uh, it will show a very uh, good discount that we managed to get from a, a real producer on one of uh, the items. Now, uh, the situation with uh, centralized programs that was mentioned by uh, some speakers before me, uh, when we are talking about uh, those programs that are run annually and that cover uh, 38 uh, actually nosologies within them, including oncology, cardiovascular diseases, and the rest. Now, the situation here is, uh, is really, uh, it is a dire one. It is uh, uh, something that we really uh, should be not just talking about, but also looking for some solutions how to address the problem. Because we do understand that starting from uh, September on, the, de the deficits will pile up and we will uh, face a, a situation, a real situation when patients will uh, have no, or very limited access to the medicines that they badly need. So we've also, we've uh, come up with some ideas on how to um, maybe regulate it in a way that uh, we can do the procurement faster. Unfortunately, uh, we've, we've sent a letter on May 14th and we yet to hear from the minister on their ideas, whether they 
are fine with them or not. And uh, we uh, really understand that uh, uh, every day uh, of procrastination, I, I can call it this way probably, that uh, we are in at the moment with the centralized programs will uh, will be uh, will uh, have dire consequences, real consequences on our patients. Uh, having said so, I would like to also um, pass my support to to the NHS of Ukraine because uh, we understand that. Uh, um, real normal operation of this institute of this institution is absolutely key to the healthcare reform in Ukraine, and uh, we really look forward to having a strong partner that we've been having for the last like um, year and more, uh, as the NHS has been till the date, and we're really worried with the situation that we, of course, are aware of, uh, with that uh, uh, competition, so to say. Thank you. Thank you, Arsene. So now, Olena Sherban, um, board member of Anti-Corruption Action Center, one of the organizers of today's Zero Corruption Talk and Zero Corruption Conference. Olena, could you please give overview and examples of how the COVID procurement are done? Because there are lots of discrediting information <laughs> about different schemes and also could you provide your remarks on behalf of civil society and watchdogging organizations your remarks on uh, NHA's uh, work and brief situation with international procurement I know that your organization together with Tabletochki and Patients of Ukraine are uh, um, controlling um, this situation conducting monitoring please uh, thank you, Hanna. Well, um, to begin with, uh, our organization uh, has for a long time has been professionally engaged in detecting corruption in public procurement. We have always focused on the procurement of medicines, which have been uh, an integral part of healthcare reform. And um, at our initiative, hundreds of corrupt procurements worth billions of hryvnia were cancelled. At the same time, we advocated for the implementation of procurement through international organization and uh, establishing of an uh, independent drug procurement agency, which now uh, my previous speaker Arsene leads. Um, and uh, the practice of uh, advocating uh, for reforms in Ukraine shows us that um, uh, only positive changes are uh, possible only when we have a synergy and interaction of international partners from the one side and strong civil society support and individual agents of change and reformers in power uh, who contribute to positive changes um, inside. Uh, but now we as a civil society are very concerned about uh, the dangerous trend of the last uh, six months when the government actually gets rid of some reformers uh, inside and uh, um, instead of that it points uh, sometimes um, people who we as a civil society consider as anti-reformers. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is very grateful and uh, honorable to have a, a, such a strong support for Ukraine from international partners. And uh, as a civil society, we ask our international partners to continue to support Ukraine, both uh, expertly sharing your um, experience and financially. But uh, from the other hand, we want to draw your attention to uh, that uh, it is crucial uh, that uh, Ukrainian government should receive um, financial assistance only um, uh, in exchange for reforms and effective mechanism of control, uh, the using of money. Fortunately, in Ukraine, we have a very strong civil society and very professional civil society, which in recent years played a crucial role in uh, promoting positive changes in Ukraine. 
and history and practice shows that um, when the government doesn't uh, take into account the position of civil society, it's always and it's not very good for the government. So these lessons must be learned. We now are seeing the factor a health to a healthcare reform and uh, some steps backwards in the area of procurement reforms, which uh, offsets all the previous steps in this area. Um, now we see that the Ministry of Health in such a dangerous and important period of global pandemic simply neglected the uh, established effective uh, procurement mechanisms um, uh, as international organization and as a procurement agency um, and the entire like uh, ministry uh, failed to the central procure procuring of drugs and uh, the entire burden of providing protection for doctors and hospitals actually fell on local authorities, volunteers and philanthropists. Uh, uh, also, from the very beginning of pandemic, we as a civil society outlined uh, very important steps that uh, need to be implemented by the ministry, uh, how to organize these truly independent procurements. Instead, the ministry began taking action only after the public pressure. Uh, now, the key mistakes and the key problems in the field of procurement, uh, we see the lack of development strategy in the procurement planning, uh, now we see that uh, ministry doesn't have any plan for the procurement uh, to this year and uh, uh, the ministry has completely moved away from identifying pandemic, uh, some uh, anti-pandemic procurement policies and guidance, uh, guidelines and instead of um, systematic, systematically interfering with the procurement agency. We have already identified a number of violations and the global uh, problems with the procurement now. And um, we fix all these problems. We report about all the violations to law enforcement agencies, uh, to controlling lay agencies. And uh, uh, that's why, uh, and that is the reasons why we need uh, a very transparent uh, mechanism, how to control the using of money which we receive from our international partners. Uh, we will continue actively monitor the process of taking place with the procurements and uh, uh, will control every step in this area as well as actively analyze the developments around the healthcare reform and uh, about all uh, what is happening around the appointments of national health service system. Um, to summarize, uh, I can um, tell that we as a country with help of our international partners and with help of uh, some reformance uh, inside the system which we have today uh, on our talk uh, should use this pandemic challenge to become a stronger and finally uh, bring about such important changes in the medical field. Thank you. Thank you, Olena. We are receiving first questions and uh, using technical opportunities, uh, Oksana Molchan already provided the um, answer to the Robert Homan's question. What has happened to one of the other aspects of Suprun's proposed program, splitting the management of hospitals between administrators uh, who are responsible for the management of the hospitals and medical directors who would be responsible for the delivery of medical services within uh, the ghost hospital? So the response is, the answer is, uh, it is not part of uh, contractual obligations between providers and um, National Health Service of Ukraine. National Health Service of Ukraine does not monitor this. To the best of my knowledge, this decree of Minister of Health came into force from uh, January 1st of 2020. Corporate management of hospitals is not NHSU focus in 2020. We might get more involved in following years. Another question, uh, I'm encouraging uh, our participants 
to uh, send their questions. So another question from Facebook, from Pavlo Kozenko. There are many communities in Ukraine which benefit from the medical reform. For instance, the town of Drohobych, where I worked, received plus 50 million of grivnas for healthcare in comparison with the previous year. This is because we treat many patients from other territories. Finally, we are able to earn money for the job we do. This also enables the patients, independently of their area of, ha of housing, to receive medical services because money follows patients. Many communities do support the medical reform. And I see here a respond uh, uh, also from uh, Viola von Kramon, uh, but they have to organize the support better and bring the support to media so that the president will be uh, will become aware of it. So I think uh, we need a louder voice from the patient, uh, patients directed to the president and to the government about the achievements of the reform. I think we could hear combined decentralization reform and healthcare reform and how they interlink. And of course, I agree that in media and in the public awareness campaign of the reform will help to avoid manipulations. Yes, another uh, question from Konstantin Zelenov, Zelenov uh, to all panelists. Good afternoon. Why don't you give to foreign partners information about pre-collapse in uh, psychiatry uh, about 20, 260 euros per hospital case, about 30 days and 1.5 euro for ambulatory uh, consultations. In this, a good change, uh, changes in healthcare. And also one anonymous attendee, in your opinion, who is favorite to be selected for the uh, NHU head position? Uh, um, the response from Oksana Mochan is high uncertainty remains. Maybe uh, Dmitro uh, Hurin, uh, if he's still uh, with us, could <laughs> answer on this question. But I think that there, there should be transparent competition and best uh, of the best candidate with uh, higher quality experience and uh, good portfolio uh, has to win because it's a question about uh, public finances and um, since we are not receiving new questions in our chat i think it's a good time to give uh, a floor to uh, katerina maternova uh, with her double responsibility, uh, representing the Euro Commission and uh, helping uh, Ukraine with our transformation and all reforms. So, uh, Katerina, you had, thank you for uh, all panelists for being with us and your contributions. And after listening to all panelists from different fields, but truly motivated uh, to have this uh, reform in democratic way, uh, please, um, could you provide some solutions? Um, what, uh, what are the mechanisms could be used from the EU side also to support Ukraine uh, to continue a public health healthcare reform in very transparent way? Please. Well, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm going to be uh, giving solutions here. Uh, what we can, I mean, the solutions are ultimately uh, matter for Ukrainians, both on the side of the authorities and the side of the civil society that uh, is both helping in the in the policies design as well as doing the the watchdog function vis-a-vis uh, -vis the authorities to find solutions. What we can do is uh, support and question, and as Viola uh, very. Uh, uh, very eloquently said, uh, you know, uh, with her with her passion and, and detailed knowledge of this sector, uh, you know, we will be we will be uh, we will continue to be partners, but we will continue to be critical partners and uh, and uh, 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 questioning and challenging you at the same time as providing support because uh, uh, I think that having having a, a prosperous and stable Ukraine that where the health sector uh, works is in our joint interest. And that's why I think that uh, uh, it's, it's a huge importance to have organizations like yours and the various uh, uh, co-presenters to 
to continue being engaged and continue questioning the the choices because that's what happens in a in a democratic society as i mentioned we support uh, long term the the health uh, health uh, uh, sector reform we very much hope that it stays on track and the two areas where i uh, mentioned we are particularly keen observers is the public procurement which was very much discussed with uh, in the panel today and the selection of the head of the uh, National Health Service. So I would not venture a, a guess of who it's going to be because uh, we very much uh, trust we will find uh, a, a solution which is going to be a transparent and merit-based uh, selection for the new head of the NHS. And I will stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina, for all your support and thank for uh, on behalf of Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians for the EU financial and technical uh, financial support, technical assistance. And now we have a question to Dmitro uh, Gurim. Uh, there are two questions, one from George Salmanev and Viktor Artemenko. Uh, first, it seems this government only respond and implements reforms when pressured by the international community. What real life pressures can we apply on the government to ensure reforms are implemented and not derailed? And Viktor Artemenko, what our MPs will do to reverse harmful to the NHSU and reform appointment? So Dmitro, uh, we with Ola Stefanishina from opposition, but together with Ola, you think uh, you have the same vision on reforms and you are a supporter of the reforms. Of could you please respond to these uh, two questions? Uh, the, the second question is uh, much easier to uh, answer. Uh, we have already the document. Uh, this is in process of signing uh, between members of parliament of all faction uh, for the residing of uh, Minister uh, Vaksim Stepanov. And uh, as I remember, uh, the, uh, the, the, this document started uh, the fraction Golas, not the Slovan or the servant of the people fraction. Uh, but uh, uh, already more senators from our fractions than from all others. And uh, I think it's political. We don't have now in uh, uh, Ukraine interpolation procedure uh, of, for the uh, exact minister, for the one minister. Uh, but uh, uh, this, this is the political process. And we understand that scandal, that everything that Minister Stepanov does goes to scandal zone. And it's toxic, and it's more and more toxic every day. And uh, I think this uh, political process will uh, steal. And uh, I hope during uh, like several weeks we will uh, decide this problem with uh, this uh, corrupted minister. And uh, uh, this is, it's a really big, big problem for our country. There's already a third minister, and it's, uh, it's this minister. It's uh, again. Uh, not the stable uh, real manager who uh, press forward uh, the uh, uh, this uh, the ministry the sorry the reform case that uh, finds more money because uh, we understand that we have COVID situation and it's a unique possibility to uh, gain more money for healthcare system and all I I'm I'm really uh, sure that all our ministers and all over the Europe they. Uh, use this case, uh, use this situation for so getting more money, uh, budget money for uh, Ministry of the Minister of Health System. And the first question was uh, sorry, about uh, Ghana Dear Hanna. The first question was uh, uh, not about the members of Parliament. But, yes. Uh, what our MPs will do to reverse harmful to the NHSU and reform uh, harmful appointment? And um, uh, what are and, um, the mechanism uh, uh, to, uh, to work with our government not using international uh, community pressure? How to make our government uh, accountable and transparent without international pressure? Like truly- Very interesting, qu very interesting question for all, the, all, all MPs in our fraction. How to do, uh, how to work with our cabinet of minister without international pressure. Uh, the, as for me, answer is already no way that uh, we need uh, international pressure. And uh, the problem is uh, with international pressure is that everybody is very, very polite. And Ukrainian cabinet ministers and Ukrainian office of president doesn't understand it. 
because everybody is so polite that uh, it looks like, uh, guys, you are doing everything well, and it's not true. So the messages have to be direct and very strict, and everybody has to understand it, that the question is not, guys, uh, uh, we have uh, some kind of a problem, but uh, guys, you cannot put the, the person for the 7% of state budget by uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, consultations during half of an hour. It's impossible. And if you want to, to have an international support, you don't have to do it. Because, okay, we'll, we'll give you like several millions of dollars for healthcare system from international uh, support. And then on the, 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 on the other hand, you put this person for the 7% of state budget. It's not possible. It's unacceptable. And it has these messages they need worse unacceptable, not possible, and what are you doing in that? Not just uh, we are you know, cons deeply concerned. It doesn't work, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitro, uh, for your strong position and uh, true dedication to make this reform in transparent way and truly patient-oriented. And uh, also, there is Robert Van Warren, uh, who is participant of our webinar, Zero Corruption Talk, uh, and he was asking about a psychiatric system, the collapse of the psychiatric system in Ukraine. And you know very well that the current financial financing system has been several, uh, several criticized before and is now criticized. And uh, it led to the collapse. Oksana Movchan already provided to respond, answer, but please, if you have uh, something extra to add, please. Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't think so. I just, I just want to say that we've contracted uh, the same volume of care that we, the historical uh, structure case. This is in the first place. In the second place, we've increased the number of providers, thus increasing the competition. Because previously it was only a traditional uh, psychiatric uh, uh, clinics. Uh, around 60, 70 in Ukraine, I guess we contracted all of them. They all received the pack. You know, I mean, received the offers from from NHSU. But we've also increased the number of providers. We added um, 150 uh, multi-profile hospitals, well equipped, well maintained, and they can also uh, provide this uh, this care. So we increased the competition in trying to increase, aiming to increase the quality of care. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana, for explaining the situation with uh, psychiatric uh, system in Ukraine. But Roy, you wanted to add something, please. Gan, I would add several words, if it's possible, after uh, about psychiatry also. Uh, uh, the problem, the problem is really we have this problem that psychiatry uh, now not not in the state that we have uh, we can start reform and without any problems. Uh, that's true. But uh, the main that we all have to understand that uh, psychiatry system is not uh, about uh, curing people in Ukraine and uh, like never were because uh, people in Ukraine with a psychiatric disease they are playing hospital and uh, it's uh, you know it's it's not modern uh, uh, ways of treating these patients. The, the main is uh, medical rehabilitation and medical social rehabilitation, we, and we don't have them. And uh, now we have like uh, hospitals all over, all over the country where uh, uh, like situated inside uh, their conditions are like in jail really. And ombudsman uh, uh, like every month uh, have a visit to these hospitals and they are uh, you know, it's, it's the, the photos from this uh, psychiatric hospitals were like more than thousand people uh, in, with more than thousand patients inside, laying in the stationary uh, mode. It's uh, it, it's also it's it's incredible. It's like a real jail, but a jail of Soviet Union of seventies, uh, eighties uh, years. Yeah, nineteen eighties. So we need this reform. And uh, the problem is that everybody says, oh, we're killing our psych uh, psychiatry system. But the reality is that our psychiatry system kills our, our Ukrainians and our patients. And we need this reform and we need money, but not just to give them money to exist. It, that, it cannot exist in this, uh, uh, this way anymore. We need money for uh, reforming the situation, for changing the medical procedures, for changing the medical uh, roads of patients and uh, to move all these patients to the multi 
uh, uh, hospitals with uh, many uh, uh, like uh, multi this multi hospitals. I'm sorry, and uh, uh, we can we we don't have to discuss uh, the situation that we're killing psychiatry. No, we have not started reform that we have to start. We had to start years ago. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dmitro and Oksana, for your um, explanation about psychiatric uh, situation and how to avoid the collapse. And uh, thank you, Robert Van Boren, for all your data and all your statistic information about the reduction of number of beds and others. I think it's a good via our online discussion uh, using Dmitro's um, opportunities as a member of parliament uh, to solve this problem and others. Uh, so, um, we have one new question uh, also. Uh, we have no another system before destroy this system. We have to prepare alternative. In Kyiv, we have just one word in multi-profile clinic. Yeah, so um, um, maybe um, um, Viola von Kramer, after listening to all speeches, could make her final comments. And uh, I will be ready to announce that within the Zero Corruption Conference, uh, we postponed the uh, conference um, after the pandemic. And it's still unclear when we will gather uh, everybody in Kyiv for three days conference. But before, we will be conducting um, online discussions, Zero Corruption Talk. As I mentioned in April, we conducted online discussion lessons of Chernobyl in times of pandemic. In May, we focused on important issue, Ukraine and Eastern partnership, ambitious post-2020 agenda. Today, we are discussing uh, public health. Uh, the next will be on judiciary system, rule of law and police reform, energy sector, because it's important for Ukraine also to be integrated, integrated in the new Green Deal. So this is uh, and decentralization reform before local elections. So for us, since we are moving to zero corruption future, uh, it's not an utopia, but still it's important to be very tough on reform implementation using strong support of our Western partners. So Viola, could you please um, summarize if you have some solutions uh, we will be ready to hear you. And I'm sure that uh, Dmitro Gurin uh, at his faction of servant of the people will raise these all questions to the president and not to allow some manipulators to falso uh, uh, falsificate the competition for uh, NHU and uh, NHU and also to do everything possible to conduct procurement and also to avoid crisis with uh, medical treatment supply for all hospitals including uh, children's one so please uh, viola Thank you, Hannah. Thank you all, uh, the panelists, uh, for, for this very great and very inspiring uh, inputs and, and uh, contributions. Before we see a shiny future in the health uh, sector, health system in Ukraine, I guess there's a lot of workload uh, ahead of us. And that was very nicely and very well portrayed uh, today in, in this webinar. And I would like to uh, pick up on what uh, Alena has uh, has mentioned today. We need the pressure as in a sandwich from both sides. On one hand, of course, politicians in Ukraine heavily depend on the opinion on the um, yeah opinion of of uh, the constituents of the voters. So it is up to the voters. It's up to the families. It's up to the people in the regions to make their voice heard. And how do we organize this when people are actually satisfied with the first steps of the reforms and they would like to have more of these reforms. They like, would like to have more quality in the health uh, system. They would like to have uh, more quality oriented uh, medical doctors and, and so on and so forth. And what was mentioned in the um, psych psychiatry now is uh, obviously still uh, lacking this kind of reforms. We are still in the uh, in, in this sector, in the more Soviet uh, style. And of course, it is up to us um, to, to uh, 
be in line with this civil society organization and to multiply, to amplify these voices. And I'm absolutely, as I said, absolutely happy to do this. And how to overcome this cocon where the president is located now, surrounded by good, uh, um, let's say, advisors, yeah, but who are not aware of the real situation in their country. I have no idea. I guess we have to really work on media. We have to work on social media. We have to bring up cases. We have to also uh, uh, go with this kind of webinars. I guess that was a very well organized and a good opportunity to show what we have. Excellent experts in the NHSU in the uh, CPR, in, in, in the uh, agencies. They are independent, they are strong, they are committed, they know what they are doing. And this we have to promote in the wider population. We have to show people you can trust your institutions. They are created for you. They work in, in your interest. I mean, there is nothing better what I've seen in Ukraine so far. So we have to show around Arzen, we have to show around Oksana Movchan, we have to show what they have achieved already in two years for you. And this, we did a, a media campaign about this. Yeah, This need to be translated to all the babushkas and all the families out there to show, hey, you can be proud of this. This is a very, it's not just a reform, it's a revolution in the health sector, yeah? And you can go out and you do not have to pay for this in a, in a shady, uh, dark envelope to, to your medical doctor to get treated by them, but you have an insurance and this insurance shows what the doctor uh, will uh, or can, can demand from you. And he can or she cannot just uh, ask for any uh, unbelievable sum, but this is a standard and is obvious what she gets. So this is a big achievement. And I would say, hey, Ukraine can be proud of this. And if the president was smart, he would also uh, lobby with this. He could campaign with this. He could use it for his local elections. I mean, I, I don't get it. I, I, I think this is what uh, Hannah and Olena said, together with the decentralization, this is the back success story what Ukraine uh, could um, deliver. And so I guess we have to rewrite this kind of history, the narratives a bit, and also push the media to put more attention on this sector. It is important because otherwise it will be abused by the old uh, uh, forces in your country. It will be a lot of corruption going into this. It will be a hidden place. And so I guess we have to put all our forces into the sector uh, to make sure uh, for us, this is a key factor. This is a key sector and we will fight for this reform as long as we can. Thank you, Viola, for such inspiring speech and your optimism and your true support. And also thanks to Katerina Maternova, Dmitro Gurin from Ukrainian parliament, Olga Stefanishina, also for thank for Oksana, Arsen, Olena, and Olya Kudinenko. And um, after today's discussion, I became even more optimistic. So with all this sabotage, all these problems, how corrupted people at the ministry are trying to undermine all our efforts, but having such powerful team of experts working in the state agencies, working in civil society, in the parliament, both from uh, presidential faction and opposition like uh, Olha Stefanishna from political party Volos, I truly believe that we will overcome all these challenges. We have to keep fighting, pushing, and be united and also to raise all this problem, be more effective in delivering to president and to Ukrainian community uh, the benefits they will gain from true reform. So um, let me uh, conclude and finish today uh, online discussion expressing my gratitude also to Gromatske, our media partner, uh, who was broadcasting and broadcasting our online uh, zero corruption talk and also announced that next week we will have another zero corruption talk. And also it's my honor and pleasure to uh, express uh, my gratitude to uh, Antak team, uh, Tatiana Shevchuk and others who were, was organizing from technical purpose uh, today's discussion. And uh, I, I think that um, we um, will succeed and it will not be easy, 
but I think uh, everything depends on us. So thank you everybody. Slava Ukraini. Uh, yes. Thank you to the European Parliament, European Commission. Thank you, Dmitro, and for your uh, principal position. And I understand that it's not easy for you within your faction. There are different groups with different interests, hidden agenda, different schemes and others. But I wish God bless you and give you more power, more strength uh, together with uh, civil society to uh, succeed, succeed. So thank you everybody and uh, uh, let's continue monitoring and observing the situation and not to allow corrupt guys to steal our future because the strongest institution we have, the strongest trust we will receive to the nation, to the country, and then it means that the victory comes for sure. Victory over aggressor and victory with reforms. Thank you, everybody, and see you next week. Thank you, Hanna, for Thank you. perfect moderating. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Stay Thank healthy. You. Bye -bye. See you soon. Yes, yeah, see you. Bye. Bye-bye.